Today's episode is brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott. Now, Joe is not only a fantastic guitar player, he draws on his years of experience as the ex-head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology and also at the McNally Smith Music College. Here's a few words from Joe about the course. You're tired of wading through hundreds of random guitar videos and just want to become a better player. Fretboard Biology is your answer. Fretboard Biology is a self-paced, college-level program that will give you the right instruction, in the right amounts, and in the right order. You'll learn the same information I taught to thousands of other guitar players over 30 years of teaching in top music colleges. If you want to make real progress with your guitar playing, then sign up for a free 7-day trial at fretboardbiology.com. Hey everyone, you're listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name's Matt Wakeling and thank you so much for joining me. And I'm joined today by my friends Gabor Jessica. Hey Matt, hey Rob. And Rob Rhodes. Hey Matt, hey Gabor. Great to see you guys. We're back for another iconic uh iconic themed show so if anyone's new to the podcast it's been running since 2016 it started off as an interview based show and uh it's still continuing in that vein but for the last 12 months or so rob and gabor have also joined me for kind of a sub series and we we called it iconic albums we're checking out a bunch of classic albums and since then we've kind of branched off into some other iconic guitar areas now today's episode is called iconic new albums and I kind of take the rap for this one because when when we were choosing our iconic albums, I think the newest one I chose was recorded in 1999. <laughs> Living in the past, man. <laughs> yeah. It was time to it was time to freshen things up. So I thought, here's the rules for today. We've all chosen two albums released since January the first, 2020, which we think are kind of cool with some interesting guitar stuff going on. Um, an additional rule for me, I didn't choose any albums that have already been featured on the podcast. For example, um, I've had interviews recently with Andy Timmons, Joe Satriani, uh, Taka from Mono, Rob Balducci. I didn't include those albums because I've already talked about those new records in depth on those interviews. So people can check out those conversations. So I, that was my rule as well. But that that was about it. Um, fellas, before we before we jump in, how did you find the challenge? Was the, was it too narrow going off two and a half years of records? Was it easy? Was it hard to find some stuff to, to talk about? Uh, it was. It, uh, I mean, one of the albums I sort of instantly kind of knew. Uh, the other one took me a little while to kind of work out what to, what to go for, and I wanted to go for something a little bit different again, and I think it will be a little bit different. So uh, I, fa- I did find it a little bit trickier because I, I don't listen to a whole lot of current sort of music. You know, I'm I, I'm becoming one of the old folks. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, music was much better in my days. Um, but um, there's lots of good stuff, actually. Once I sort of looked into it, there's a ton of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Rob? Yeah, I thought it was going to be hard and then... It was hard, but not the way I thought it was going to be because <laughs> I thought it was going to be hard to find something and then it was hard yeah. to narrow it down. So um, I might, as we talk, I might go through some of the albums that missed out, but um, yeah, I yeah. set myself um, some extra criteria as well. And yeah, what, what'd you have? So I had to have either bought the album uh-huh. so, um, or listened to it more than 20 times. Wow, nice. So nice. We'll, we'll, I'll do it like a little speed round countdown and we'll get down to the two that I chose, yeah. Yeah, cool. Hey, we've also got a huge stack of records from um, some of the listeners and the folks uh, through an Instagram question. Oh, um, we're building up there's – a, there's a great little Instagram community that are chiming in on some of these questions I raise every now and then about some of these episodes we're going to do. So uh, we'll hear a bunch of really cool suggestions. Hello, Instagram well. community. Hello. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Let's start talking about some records. Um, I reckon, Rob, you and I both chose an album, different albums from the same artist, Ariel Posen. Yep. Why don't we start with those two records? We'll we'll kick off with the double Ariel. Okay. That sounds great. So um, my introduction to Ariel Posen was, I think, almost during lockdown. So I didn't really know much about him. I, I sort of... 
I know he came, he played with the brothers Landreth and that kind yeah. of thing. But, um, yeah, I sort of came across him by accident. He did a live stream for this, which is actually this album. He, um, he's quite active on, online, isn't he? Yeah. Like with, with doing YouTube stuff and being being doing live streams and doing live performances online and, and stuff like that. Absolutely. And a lot of like those silent with audiences all wearing cans, and um, the, which is this album as well. Um, so, yeah, I chose Familiar Ground because it was, even though the songs are pre-2020, this is kind of like my introduction to him, so the first album I heard from him. And yep. it's live, it's like I can't stop listening to it. I think I must listen to it at least once a week. It's kind of like my drive. If I'm edgy before a gig and I've got an hour's drive or something, uh-huh. I throw that on and I, I come out of the other side and I'm ready, you know, like I'm in a good nice. space mentally. Uh, so the first track I chose off that was the song Try, mm-hmm. which is everything I love about Ariel Posen. It's smooth. Uh, it's got those harmonies, just killer musicianship. And then almost this triplet feel funky guitar solo on the mm-hmm. low notes, you know, cause he, for anyone who doesn't know Ariel, he, a lot of the time he plays this baritone um, yeah. It's an aluminium hollow bodied strat type guitar, um, and it's tuned to a baritone tuning. Oh, that that blue one. Yeah. Ah, oh, cool. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was actually going to ask that. Yes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's... and it's just a regular scale length, but he uses super heavy gauge strings and yeah. um, yeah. tuned it to baritone. And a uh, shout out to uh, Jack Hudson, who is uh, a who's who pedal builder and guitar player extraordinaire here in Queensland yeah. who built uh, there is a podcast with him on the the super fun awesome happy time pedal show yes. podcast. <laughs> and and he nice. he built Ariel's one of Ariel's pedal boards oh, did he? like oh, wow. his fly little fly rig yeah so oh, sh- cool, shout out to Go Jack. Jack yes hey, Jack. so try was my pick um number one pick from that album yeah um the second choice is uh get you back because yeah. it's the most I think it's over seven minutes long and it's the most lush kind of well-built solo that just takes you on a journey. It's beautiful tones and oh, I can't, yeah, I, there's not more much more I can say about that record. I think people just sort of need to listen to it and just immerse yourself in it. Because it, That's actually another thing I was going to ask is if the version I listened to is that a rarity that is that the solo went on for that long, but it isn't then. <laughs> no, because it is a live record. It's like yeah, recorded yeah, yeah. live in the studio. You can go on YouTube and actually watch. Well, I think I, that's what I did. I yeah. watched. I watched a lot of the stuff, and um, yeah, it went into this very extended solo, and it kind of yeah. the feel changes the whole song during the solo, and yeah. it builds and builds and builds. Yeah, yeah. Just I don't know. It's got all the ingredients for me. In any mood, almost like it can be background, or you can crank it up and just get smacked in the face when he hits that low E and um, the changing up between playing with his fingers and a pick and slide and yeah, it's just a really great um, combination of of what music can be, and I think he he nailed it on that record and it's live. You know, like mm. another thing yeah. that's beautiful yeah. about it. Yeah, awesome, man. Um, yeah, that Get Put You Back solo is killer because on his studio stuff, he's a little more strained. He won't do the seven-minute mega solo <laughs> no. fade out, which is cool too. There's like a discipline there. Um, but, yeah, that's that's epic, man. He's, he's going hard on that. And try, he's – I don't think he's playing slide at all on that, which no. on the – the album I'm going to mention in a moment, Headway, there's heaps of slide on that record. So for me to hear a, a non-slide solo, it's like, yeah, cool. This is really this is really neat. And uh, that low tuning you talked about, so fun. And um, the slap back on, the, on that solo. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. And just the finger plucking the strings and just hearing that slap against the frets, you know, like... I don't know. It just feels like the guitar's in the room with you, and it's not yeah, compressed yeah. crazy, and there's none of that ironing it all out. But it's just there. It's open. It's beautiful. It's yeah. I love that record. I, I, nice. On try, I quite like uh, the, the the chord choices and the voicings that he plays. Uh, I mm-hmm. find quite nice. 
Um, just interesting, sort of unusual to me sounding chord voicings that he seems to be playing. Uh, for what is, I mean, really, uh, if you strip everything down, a fairly straightforward song. Yeah. But just made interesting through the chord voicings. When some of them, I, I can't, I don't think I've ever heard anyone play any voicings like that before. So that was really cool. Um, quite all, dissonant, a lot of those voicings too, which I always like. I'm always a fan of dissonance. Dissonance is yeah. my friend. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a cool. I like that song. Try it. It was a cool song. I, I wrote down "feel good vibe." It has a good sort of groove. You just, you know, what's that movie um, where they sit in the car and they do the head thing? <laughs> Night yeah. at the Roxbury. Night at the Roxbury. That's right. <laughs> it made I'm me do say the head Wayne's thing. World. Yeah. It made me do the Night of the Roxbury head yeah. thing. You know, that's um, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I think he's benefited from. You know, he's one of those guitarists who's come through off the back of the John Mayer kind of juggernaut. Yeah, you know, a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. a lot of those types, the brothers Landreth and him and <clears throat> so another guitarist we're going to talk about later, but a whole bunch that have come through on the back of John Mayer making it cool to have pop songs and guitar solos and jazz yeah. jazz chords and yeah. you know, those yeah. strange inversions happening and that became that's become really cool, you know, to do. In a in a no. sort of when guitar isn't super cool, you know. Yeah, totally, totally. It's and cool, it's delivered, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's delivered, delivered in such a song serving way. It's it's mm. beautiful. Yeah. Well, let's let's keep talking Aria. I'll talk about the record I chose, and we can just keep yep, okay. bouncing back and forth. Um, mm. So I chose a couple of songs off the album Headway, which was released. I think was it this year or last. Uh, 21 it was released last year and um, that was sort of my introduction to uh, Posen as a recording artist I've seen heaps of YouTube stuff and and gear demos and little mini clips he's done and interviews and things but um, yeah this was the record I got into so Rob when you when you bought Familiar Ground that live record from 2020 that was cool too that kind of stretched it out for me a bit more too but yeah, yeah headway such a good record um two <clears> tracks <throat> i chose the standouts what are we doing here and i'm gone so what are we doing here like super soulful beautiful chord changes man the guitar tones the 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 underlying padding guitar tones with the vibrato and maybe it's a harmonic trem or something i don't know it's just beautifully beautifully voiced and uh, takes a slide solo in that song, lots of slide. Um, such a that's vocal a, slide player. Well, that's, I was just about to say, like, great solo. The, the very, very vocal melody, the, the solo. And, and um, I always like, that's one of the, I always like slide players that play that kind of, and it almost sounds like a singer. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, Derek and, Trucks yeah. comes to mind yeah, straight yeah, well, away. He's, he's, he's kind of he's reinvented slide. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. He's... he's He's clearly got some blues vocabulary and reference, but yeah. he doesn't he doesn't live there. He takes it different places. Yeah, he's got a very similar slow slide vibrato to Bonnie Raitt too. Like there's a there's okay. a there's okay. a big Bonnie Raitt thing I hear there too, which is probably what dra- dragged me in to begin with with him. It's like the smooth vocals, the slide delivery. It's not yeah. it's not super fast. You know, he can play fast, but he chooses yeah. you know the tastier choice over maybe the more um eclectic or shredder choices yeah totally and he does a whole bunch of that um fretted notes behind the slide so the slides on his pinky and he's got those other three fingers especially the first finger he's using to fret notes underneath the slide and that that okay. pulls you out of that blues ca- um kind of land as well it's such a such an interesting Way to play. Funny you talk about vibrato as well. My daughter's a, a pianist and a great singer, and she she noticed his vocal vibrato, and then she listened to his guitar playing and, and comment on the vibrato there. Yeah, okay. right. so it's so what what did she, she what did she pick up on? <clears throat> she liked with the the vocal vibrato. She's saying yeah, it's not super fast. It's it's well controlled and um, just on the end of the notes, like a lot of the the greats do. It's it's. Uh, it's chosen. It's not like auto vibrato that like some singers will have, or guitar players for that matter. Well, I saw an interview with on that. I saw an interview with Nuno Betancourt many, many years ago, and he said 
that one thing he found was that guitar players who sing have the same vibrato, the speed of their vibrato in their singing oh, as they're playing, and he worked really hard uh-huh. on slowing his vibrato down on his voice. Okay. So differing it, like, and he really worked hard on that. So it's it's something interesting that if you are a guitar player singer out there, maybe record yourself and, and see mm. if that's true for you as well. That's yeah, I was, really I was just about to say the same thing, actually. Oh, <laughs> we're on the same page, at least yeah, at yeah. this moment. <laughs> do you guys, because you guys sing, I, I don't sing lead vocals. Do you, do you guys think about that kind of stuff? Uh, I will now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I do, I do. Every time I hear myself a recording of myself, I always find my vibrato, I have too, my voice vibrato, vocal vibrato is too fast. I always kind of cringe a bit. Uh-huh. But then I've, I've had people say it, I, they like my vibrato on the voice, so I don't know. Yeah, I've heard them make um, comparisons to Belinda Carlisle, but um, that's another story. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> it's funny, though. It's funny if you that's uh, a situation, have a listen to, yes. uh, just, just totally, I mean, unrelated, but vibrato related. One of the weird things is when you, listen, when you hear singers that don't have any vibrato. And like, uh, if you listen to Oasis, um, uh, uh, Liam Gallagher, yeah. he doesn't have any vibrato, and it's weird. <laughs> There's something really weird about it. When you, anyway, that's just yeah. Yeah, and then it crosses think, the line. Oh, sorry, Matt. I was going to say I don't think any singer singer used vibrato in the nineties. Come on. Oh, oh what about Eddie Vedder? Eddie Vedder sounds like he's yodeling George sometimes. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was watching the the new live thing that just went up on Prime. Um, of they did in Seattle for the homeless, and okay. I, I was just sitting there going, I didn't like really his voice is out front, and I hadn't noticed how much it sounds like he's yodeling. <coughs> and, yeah. yeah, wow. You know, you yeah. just him go, and the, wow. the Creed guy, they have that similar sort of voice. That oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right Scott Stapp. <laughs> <laughs> I came across him on Cameo t- when I was looking through some uh, cameos today for a possible uh, marketing push for the band and he wanted something like four hundred and forty four dollars it started for Scott Stapp. Wow. wow. To get him to just that's a very specific <laughs> number, isn't it? <laughs> I thought it would have been no, I'm not gonna say that. But yeah, the um the vibrato thing is really interesting because you know you've got I mentioned Belinda Carlisle and Stevie Nicks, mm. which are very that fast, sure. you know, yeah. um the intonation Goat like some might say, yeah. like greatest <laughs> greatest of all time. Goat means yeah, um, yes, yes. And yeah, yeah. Linda uh, Carlisle, greatest of all time vibrato. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, yeah. So I think because I'm mostly a rock singer, my vibrato. I've really tried to smooth mine out because mm. I tend to okay. I tend to get a little bit warbly. So it, it's been something that I've worked on. And then occasionally, when you get space to really have a slow vibrato. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's so much easier to have a fast vibrato as a singer yeah. than a slow, controlled one. So, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it is, it's, I love talking about this stuff. It's great. Yeah, cool, man. Um, th- the only other thing I want to say about Ariel Posen is that um, in that tune, I'm Gone, uh, there's a great outro solo, um, again, on slide, and he, he uses heaps of fars, like a, quite a – Quite a lot of his solos on the new record, anyway, sound like he's cranked the fuzz. I think fuzz on slide is such a cool sound. Hmm. Yeah, well, and- Gary Clark Jr. is one. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, Derek Trucks, not so much. He doesn't really use pedals. He's just like a cranked amp and the volume, pedal, the volume knob and the tone knob. But um, yeah, that that generation, Joey Landreth is another one, right? Who's you know yeah, big yeah. on those tones. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wrote down in "I'm Gone." I the, there's, uh, I think there's a second guitar in that. It's two. Is there two guitars in that? And it's um, uh, one's playing like a Leslie part. Yeah, yeah. That's a cool the Leslie part. I really like that. It's a cool sounding Leslie. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. The, that's, the, I'm just reading what I've written down. So that's uh, sure. Um, definitely the, those. Yeah, he pulls beautiful tones all over the place, and some of them they're up front tones, some of them they're like these interesting kind of rhythm, rhythm parts. But yeah, all right, two albums, two killer albums since twenty twenty. Ariel Posen's made two of them himself. 
Nice work. Nice work there. Uh, Gabor, let's go to one of your records that you chose. All right. Which one do you want to do? The, do you want to get it out of the way first or do you want to wait, leave it till later? <laughs> <laughs> you, you choose, man. They're, they're both okay. great. I, I enjoy both very much. Oh, good. Okay. okay. Well, I don't, I'll just go in order. I've got it written down here. So the first one I picked um, yep. is, uh, even though I've already uh, talked about her, yeah. Uh, in our iconic series, but this is a different album, so I thought, you know, why not? Uh, yeah. So it's St. Vincent's Daddy's Home. Yeah. Um, so it's the sixth studio album by St. Vincent, released on May 14, 2021. Uh, it was produced by Annie Clark alongside Jack, Jack Antonoff, who uh, worked with Taylor Swift and uh, Florence and the Machine, Lord or Lordy. Is it Lordy or Lord? Lord. Lord, 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 Lord. Silent D, okay. Uh, it was recorded at Electric Lady Lane in New York, and the sort of the concept behind the album is uh, early se- first half of the seventies New York, New York music. Um, so she mentions Stevie Wonder, Sly and the Family Stone, David Bowie, Steely Dan, amongst others, as sort of the influences that kind of music. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, I've said it heaps of times before, but I think to me she's sort of one of the few. Artists in a in a you know critically acclaimed in the sort of main spotlight artist at the moment who's really doing interesting stuff and really creative stuff. So uh, yeah, um, this album also won best alternative music album at the 2022 Grammy Awards. Um, yeah, uh, so the two songs I chose, uh, I mean they're all good songs. It's a really good. I think to me it's a it's a really strong album as a whole. Uh-huh. Um, all the songs are pretty good, but the two songs I seem to kind of gravitate to the most, and partially also because it has sitar guitar in it, which I mean, just for that, she should get applauded, applauded for. Yeah, <laughs> uh, one's down, and the other yeah. one is melting of the sun. Awesome. So, what 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 were your thoughts on 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 those songs, and or, or have you guys listened to the whole album at all? Or I kind of yeah, got, I have yeah, yeah. When it first came out. I gave it a good couple of spins because um, I, I think I mentioned it on the last time we spoke about um, Annie that um, I really, really want to like her and I really, really want to get into it, but it hasn't connected at all with me. Um, I think there are moments on this record that I love. They remind me, they've got that Bowie, Devo. Young Americans thing, yeah. Tin yeah. Machine even, like maybe maybe less Tin Machine. But um, that experimentation vibe of it. But I do love the call and response vocals, um, especially Pay Your Way in Pain. Like, I do love that song. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's not it's not something that, again, I really want to like it and I really want to be, <laughs> you know, positive. But she just hasn't, she hasn't hit me yet. As, no, that's fair enough. As a musician and as a speaker and an artist, I love her. But the music just hasn't hit the mark for me yet. Fair enough. You'll learn one day. Yeah, I know. I'm, st- <laughs> I'm still young. You know, I've got, I got a ways to go. <laughs> uh, what was the iconic album we did for this, for St. Vincent? Uh, Her self titled one. The, the, That's right. Yeah. So I checked out Daddy's Home after that episode because you guys were both saying, yep, yeah, give, give yep. Daddy's Home a spin. It's, it's a bit more song oriented. Yeah. Um, so I was interested here in that context a bit more, but I enjoyed your two standout tracks, Gabor. The um, down's kind of funky. I like the the auto wah solo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, That's cool. So it's it's there's there's a story. She there's a story that she sort of um, told somewhere. I watched online um, about that song. So she set up a studio at home because of the whole. It was all just as sort of COVID happened. You know, she mm-hmm. started working on this album, and uh, she set up a studio at home and. Uh, I think I think it was Jack Antonoff who they've become good friends, and he sort of produced a multi instrumentalist. He played pretty much all the drums on that album and a lot of the bass and did a lot of the synth stuff. He said to her, "You really need to get into into modular synthesis because that's that's you know you love it." And so apparently that's the very first thing she plugged in the modular synthesizer, very first time, just plugged it all in and got something. Okay. And that sequence at the start is that very first thing she ever got. Out of a modular synthesizer, so she oh, okay. recorded it, and that sort of became the the song, uh, which is kind of cool. But yeah, that, that envelope filter wah kind of solo is really cool. Yeah. 
uh, the the sitar counter melody. Um, yeah, that sort of sitar guitar which she plays. So she like an old choral sitar guitar. She played it. Okay. Um, she did all that stuff. I do love um, that choral sitar stuff. Like, I mean, is it a um, Jerry Jones that she I has? Think, yeah, I think it's yeah the Jerry the, the, the original. Like, she's got one of the old ones. I think the original old ones. Yeah. Um, because live, um, the other guitarist, whatever his name is, the second guitarist in the band, uh, uses one of those Jerry Jones. The one it has sort of like a. I don't know what you call it. Finish. It's sort of red, kind of weird finish, and it's got those sympathetic strings. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's it's. I, I love. Um, I, I remember um, back in the days, Beck did a couple of songs that had sitar guitar in it, and I always wanted one. Uh, I just. I, I don't know. It just love something about it. Just really, I like it. <laughs> yeah, friend of the show, Peter Northcote plays one on his um, Twitch channel. Oh, cool. Um, he yeah. does the massive attack song. <laughs> Um, and he plays it on that. And I think he oh, plays cool. it on a couple of other songs, but yeah, it's great, great sound. I love that stuff. I love that Maybe stuff. You just play Norwegian wood for six months if you want, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd play <laughs> Master, Master Plan by Diesel. I'd, I'd it's play. funny. Oh da- yeah, come yeah. on. Yeah. 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 Dan yeah. Electra made a made a, I think it was called the Baby Sitar, and it's shaped like a sitar, but it's like a guitar. Um, and oh, there was one at the local music shop, and I was going to buy it, but it sold just before I got it. But, but you can buy a bridge um, that yeah, fits to the yeah. Dan Electrode and makes it sound like it. Les Rankin, yeah. um, Sydney Guitar Tech. He he, I was he was the first I saw with it on one of his um, yeah. Dan Electros, and it sounds great. Wow. But I love that, that Jerry Jones with those the the ten or whatever sympathetic strings that go yeah. across. I just I, yeah. I one day. What was that band? There was an Australian band, sort of a. Um, that gets it, everybody. Uh, taxi we're ride. Right. Taxi ride. Yeah. They had. They were using one of them in, in one of their songs, and just for that, I like that song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about the Steve Vai crazy guitar that's got all those sympathetic strings on it? Oh yeah, what is the it new called? electric? The, um, the Hydra. Hydra. The Hydra. Yeah. The Hydra. Hail Hydra. That's insane. That video. Well, actually, <laughs> when I went to see Steve Vai years ago, um, it was um, um, Mike Keneally. Uh, oh yeah, who's yep. just insane? I mean, yeah. he, he to me he stole the show over Steve Vai because he was playing keyboard and guitar harmony solos to himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like yeah. he was playing a, one hand tapping on the guitar and the other hand playing the keyboard solos. I but saw him played, do that with Satriani. Yeah, unreal. Yeah. He's an, he's amazing, and he played uh, in a couple of songs. He had a sitar guitar on a stand there, Mike Keneally. Rock and anyway, roll, man. I digress. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. Anyway, back to that. I'm, I'm talking, aren't I? Um, yeah, I, I mean, a whole tr- the whole album to me is really, really good. I, I like, I, like I said, I, I really like Saint Vincent. I think she's great. I think she's uh, very interesting in what she does. Uh, she she kind of picks characters David Bowie esque for her albums, uh-huh. and I, I particularly love this. I love all that kind of, um, I lo- uh, you know, Stevie Wonder, Sly and the Family Stone. I love, I love those guys, and that sort of funky but kind of sophisticated funky kind of music. Um, I really dig it. Yeah, it's cool. I, I guess the, uh, just w- only one other comment for me was um, similar to the say, self-titled record, it was really interesting for me not knowing when the guitars stopped and when they ended because uh, there was a lot of cool processing going on for this record too. Yeah, yeah, there was. There definitely is. There's, there's always interesting sounds on her albums because I think she she's never happy with just recreating what she did before. She always wants to find something else and she's always sort of striving for new sounds. Yeah, nice. It's awesome, awesome. All right, that's three records down since Woo-hoo. 2020 with cool guitar stuff. We're going to take a short break, but before we do, I want to give you some of the suggestions uh, from our Instagram page, Guitar Speak Podcast over there if you want to jump on. Um, man, some great records here. Some of these I know, some of them I don't. I'll be interested to, to see... What tweaks in your your memory, fellas? Um, okay. Mr. Glynn's Pickups, who I know ah. you know, Gabor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Glynn's Pickups is in Blackstrap Blues. Hindsight is 2020. It's the only instrumental guitar album I can listen to over and over. Bill Gola Guitars, um, Iconic. Second Skin is pretty good. Iconic, they're like a metal super group. Michael Sweet and Joel Hoekstra on guitars, friends of the show. Man, oh, on the said on- that ba- 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 Bagley Guitars. Bill Gola. Uh, Bill Gola. Bagola Bagola guitars. Guitars. Yeah, Sorry, Northern it... Beaches. Um, okay. I just want to – he does the best sparkle finishes. They look oh, yeah. amazing. Absolutely. Like, oh, it's, I think 
Yeah, if I don't get a second Duesenberg, I might get him to build me one. <laughs> yeah, man. Ooh. Get him to refinish a Duesenberg. Mm, no, I've got um, Begola Guitars. Also, Chris Stone, Kingfish, Ingram 662. Yep, I've heard that record. It's awesome. Uh, Ricky Wood, Classless Act, seemed pretty good. Throwback glam vibes. Steve Kemsley, um, great drummer, mate of mine in Korea at the moment. Larry Basillo, Far More and Your Love album. Larry mm-hmm. Basillo, she's awesome, man. Um, Justin Studley, don't think anyone really likes this album, but Fear of the Dawn, Jack White has some completely <laughs> unique guitar tones. I tend to listen to it while hanging washing. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. Um, yeah, he's doing some cool stuff, Jack yeah. White. Come on. Uh, Cameron Jones, guitar, friend of the show, Ch- Chavolo Schmidt, Miri Church. No, I'm really sorry. I've, I've, I've monstered that pronunciation, Cameron. <laughs> but I will check out the record. Uh, Image 62 is saying Madison Cunningham for the sake of rhyme. Yeah, she's um, good. I need to Madison check her Cunningham. Out. Yeah, she's really good. I got into her, stumbled across her in lockdown in a. You know, you go down a rabbit hole with a couple of artists and then um, you get suggestions of other artists and that popped up and, yeah, she's... Okay. Yeah, very good. Awesome. Pants4822. Hi, Matt. (laughs) Werewolves of Portland. Paul Gilbert, just a stunning technician. Great sound with a hint of his cheeky personality, always on show. From the UK, Ibanez boys, Ray, Adam and Dave the Vampire. These are the guys who do all the... um, uh, repair and warranty work for Ibanez in the UK. We've we've chatted okay. before. Good guys. Hey fellas. Um, yeah, I've heard that record. The the Paul Gilbert. He plays everything on it. Oh, it's insane. And it's a really fun record. Yeah. yeah. He just makes me smile. He's he's, oh, he's great. Yeah, he's great. His enthusiasm. He's like he's like um, the crocodile hunter of of guitar playing. <laughs> <laughs> he's just always so enthusiastic. He's I like yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. He plays every note like he means it. Yeah. He pulls those faces, whether he's sitting down doing a little video at home or <laughs> rocking the stadium, man. I love it. Oh, yeah. um, Big Bird Band writes, Big Wreck, but for the Sun was 2019, but the two EP since, called 7.1, 7.2, are freaking insanely good. Thornley is an utter monster. So there's that. And I think there was another comment. Um, oh, there's a couple here, sorry. Guitar Street Co. Andrew Mara does some really cool guitar rescues he calls them on japanese guitars he's talking about tool because he always is um <laughs> and then he goes oh no that record was from 2019 <laughs> for oh, which was it I, really I, insomnia was it oh, oh yeah. man yeah. so many the albums inoculum? i thought of fell in yeah, 2019 same. i was like oh if it, if it had to be 2019 <laughs> you're on, inoculum not in something else. i was thinking of winding it back but it just didn't sound round enough so warren riley uh shouted out james ivani who just got a, a short custom Signature model guitar. Congrats, James. That's awesome. He writes, uh, Sigil, groundbreaking work between acoustic and analog synth. Although only a short offering, each song is a movie unto itself. And he's, um, yeah, Vanny's got some more proggy stuff around too. Amazing. So there's some listener um, suggestions. Great, Some great records there. Some great calls and some cool stuff I've got to check out. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with three more killer guitar records in the last, at least in the last couple of years. This episode is brought to you by Fretboard Biology, a comprehensive online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott, ex head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology and the McNally Smith College of Music. I was one of the beta testers for the course and can say as a music educator, I was really impressed by the logical sequence of learning. The course has also been endorsed by players such as Brett Garson and Greg Cock. For more details, check out the links in our show notes. All right, welcome back. It is Iconic New Albums. I'm with Robin Gabor. We're talking about some cool guitar music or cool music with cool guitars uh, that's been launched, released since January 2020. Rob, what's what's your second record? All right, so I mentioned it earlier. I had a criteria of um, I had to have either bought it or I'd listened to it 20 times. So, And I also mentioned there were a lot of albums. I, I just – I had – I think if you guys had been watching the, the Google Doc where we were putting them in <laughs> one night, my <laughs> albums changed like 10 times. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But just a quick – Quick rundown of what I had. I had Mammoth WVH, yeah. um, Tyler Bryant, 
um, and the shakedown's pressure. Keith Urban's speed of now. Eric Gale's crown. Uh, Krishna Jones, who, um, mate, great guitar player in Australia, was in the band Juice. Um, his album, The Other Side, for me, was just, it's brilliant. Um, Gaslighter by the Chicks, although it's not a very guitar album, which is why that missed out. And Dirty Honey's new record. Uh, and then it just missed out because it had only been out a week, but Tedeschi Trucks just released a double album and it oh, is wow. phenomenal. Like it's, uh-huh. it runs the, gam- the gambit of like everything they can do from the Middle Eastern sounds to, you know, just, yeah, desert, desert landscapes and blues and soul and everything and funk. It's got everything. But, so can I just yeah. can I jump in then? Yeah. Just with that in mind, Rob, that you've got such a big list. Um, sometimes as guitar players we can think, oh, you know, guitar's out of fashion because we're not hearing shredding solos across every inane pop song as we used to <laughs> in the olden days. Didn't matter what the song was. Steve Lukather was providing some fun for, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for everyone uh, and, his, and his colleagues. Um but there's always great music around, and if you dig around, there's there's awesome stuff. It's just not on top forty radio anymore, yeah. and that's fine. That's 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 no biggie. There's always cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, Rob. So with that in mind, your second one. My second one came down to two choices, and it was Diesel's Sunset Suburbia, which mm-hmm. just missed out to Marcus King's El Dorado, um, and so yes. Marcus King El Dorado. That's my second choice. And the um, the two songs I chose off that, the first one is The Well, which is yeah. an old-fashioned barn burner, you know, riff, great guitar riff, vocals out there with just drums, you know, creating in the old-school 70s fashion. Um, and, the, and the second track was One Day She's Here, which is like the complete opposite to that song. It's like yeah. a very soulful, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, sweet sounding song. Um, but both displaying everything and anything that Marcus can do on guitar because he's probably one of the best guitar players of the new breed who I describe as fearless. And yeah. he just yeah. goes for things and does things that are outside the norm of what other guitar players are doing. Probably closer to that kind of Larry Carlton sort of bluesy style thing than um, mm-hmm. you know than a straight blues player. But when you look at his um, discography and what he's done, he's gone from very gospel style stuff to funk and blues and dirty blues and rock, mm-hmm. and and somehow made the guitar. Not always the focus, but when it's there, it just slaps you in the face. And uh, this album was produced, this one and his latest one, which is just about to come out, um, by the Black Keys' Dan Erbach. Oh, yeah, I okay. saw, I saw yeah. a live clip and he was playing guitar with him on stage. Yeah. So yeah. They've, they've struck up a little partnership in recent times and uh, I think he's – Reaping the rewards of that. That's yeah. awesome, mm. man. I first heard of him um, oh, probably about three or four years ago. I was writing some articles for Jam Buzz, which is like an online sort of magazine thing, and um, the, the editor said, can you do a gear rundown of Marcus King? I'm like, yeah, sure. Who's Marcus King? <laughs> and um, far out, man. And he was like 21 then. A, a grizzled veteran of the road, like he's been playing gigs since he was what six or something. I don't know. Well, he looked um, very young in all those the clips I saw. Yeah. Well, he is very young. I mean, yeah. for for the stuff that I watched, the two, the yeah, for this, yeah, he looks very yeah, when, young. When I say grizzled, that, that's not true. But he's he's, <laughs> he's just played a gazillion gigs, and he's, yeah, yeah, he's fearless on stage. Absolutely, that's such a good description, Rob. Um, he. Marcus King, he's been doing his own albums, what, the last two or three records? Before that, it was the Marcus King Band, yeah. which to me, this this record, I mean, maybe one day she's here is a little different, but this record seems a little rootsier than some of the early stuff, Rob. Is that um, No, I think fair? it's I think it's just a, an evolution. Like he's just right. really honing. He's always had those acoustic kind of campfire-y, 
you know, southern influenced songs, you know, southern blues, um, mm-hmm. as well as the rockers. But then he's always had horns. Like even you yeah, go back and look, cool. he did a tiny desk concert, which is like phenomenal. And yeah. see, he's on, his live band's nearly the same as the Marcus King band. Okay, um, that band's killer, man. Yeah, this so one's cool. more of a trio thing um, right, that yeah. he did. He, I think he was on Kimmel and they just did the two songs as a trio. Um, yeah. But, yeah, he's definitely just flexing his muscle a bit more, his songwriting muscle now. Um, and, yeah. yeah, with the help of Dan, I guess. And yeah, But, yeah, some of the older cool. stuff, it's... It, again, like Ariel Posen, he chooses very interesting chords and chord progressions and inversions and just, yeah, some of his solos are um, just out of the box, completely out of the box. You don't expect him to go where he goes sometimes. Um, yeah, nice. Which is great, great to hear. Definitely, definitely. The Well has like super cool riffs and um, and he's a great singer too. Um, I, know with, I know we're talking guitars but... A lot of the people we've talked about so far, great, great vocalists as well. Well, I, I, it was funny actually because I listened to the Well first, and I went, "Oh, that sort of sounds very ZZ Top." Um, and <laughs> actually, the thing, the first thing I wrote down is, Z- Z. <laughs> "Well, you know, we're we're not in America, we're in Australia." That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, and the first thing I actually wrote down is, "Oh, here we go, another nerdy white guy playing the blues." But. <laughs> But then, what's wrong with that? That was the well. No, nothing wrong with that. The well. But then I listened to um, one day she's here, and I just it, I I love that. That was yeah. The the other song I can sort of yeah you know, but uh, and I wrote down great voice like yeah. really really good voice. And I watched uh, the the album version and I watched the live clip which had Dan Auerbach playing guitar and it is yeah cool, great voice and. Um, very Motowny, like the string arrangement has a very Motowny vibe to it in that song, and it sounds like really old school Motown, like for a new album. So yeah, I was that, that I was really impressed with the second song. The first song was yeah, sorry, another white guy playing the blues, but um, <laughs> the oh, second song I really dug. Yeah. I'm a sucker for a you know big distorted <laughs> riff, and you know yeah. I'm I'm old school that way, but you know huh. that Led Zeppelin-y type. You know, with a riff and then the vocals sitting out there with the drums and then the riff comes back and no. yeah, yeah, it is. It's kind of derivative, but I wanted to just pick a fun barn burner yeah, song yeah, off that yeah. record and then the juxtaposition yeah. of the second song, which kind of gives you a completely yeah. different flavor. It it yeah. definitely was very unexpected after the first song. It was quite unexpected to hear that second song. Awesome man, yeah, he's great and he's um. He plays. Uh, he's got well, a, a three. Well, he's got a bunch of guitars, obviously. But he's he started out being well known for playing a three four five. Yeah. Owned by his grandfather. Wow. It's called his grandfather's vintage three four five. Wow. Um, Gibson ended up making a, a signature model for him, but um, that's yeah. Pretty I think cool it's just, it was released not long ago, wasn't it? That. Mm. Yeah, because I, I remember that's. I, I didn't know who he was when you when you wrote the name down, but then when I saw the cowboy hat, and I went, "Oh, I saw that face somewhere." Yeah, and I think it was Gibson releasing his signature guitar. Because there's Not- a rig rundown with him, and he just he goes, "Oh yeah, I occasionally use this Telecaster, but mostly it's the the Gibson." Yeah. But he also just got a um an orange signature model amp too. Oh wow! So okay, so it's like a one channel. Um, well, maybe OD. that's what I saw. I just, it was really recently, like only a couple of months, maybe for even a, the uh, NAM show that was just on. So like, like a month ago, two months ago, I remember seeing his face for some signature gear. Yeah, it's got like three knobs on it. One of them's a massive one right in the middle <laughs> and then that's it, you know. That's the dream. Well, with orange, man. You, you, there's, it's so cryptic. You don't want too many knobs because you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> you got to work out the pitch. <laughs> I think they uh, call back to the Wiggly, you know. Yeah. The yeah. Wiggy, yes. Phoebe. <laughs> the Wiggy. Yeah. Phoebe Wiggy. He, um. He used to use a tube screamer as like an attenuator for whatever amps he was using. I can't remember the amps he was using, um, but it's, you know, these custom tube amps. Yeah. But he'd have on the amp, he'd have the tube screamer. Okay. Um, he'd have the amp cranked to one million, but the tube <laughs> screamer would be his master volume. Okay. And he'd just put a little yeah. bit of drive in anyway, because why not? So that was kind of a... That's as long as I've known him, he's screamer. always used oranges, but he just kind of used... Yeah, okay. You know, just the standard. I think 
was it the rock of herb or one of those yeah, it, yeah rock of herb seems to be the one everyone uses yeah yeah, yeah cool man yeah great great artist great record he's been to australia f- a few times already I'm yeah sure i saw him at blues fest and um oh yeah poor guy he was um he had one of those days where he's um something played up and then his belt broke and he's just trying to hold his playing, trying to hold his pants up. And Sheesh. it was just, you could see him laughing. He was kind of frustrated, but he was just kind of giggling as well, going, you know, the show must go on. And oh, wow. I did, I did admire him for that. Was, uh, Who needs pants anyway? Overrated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, Gabor, you've been threatening us all night. What have you got? <laughs> All right. Okay. So the, <coughs> the second album I chose is by a Japanese band called Boris, and it's uh, the latest album called W. Now, W is the, and hang on to your shorts, folks, 27th <laughs> studio album by Boris. Wow. 27th. Wow. Um, it was released on 21st of January 2022. Um they're a band that's been around since 2000, sorry, since 1992 uh, from Tokyo. And they're three piece uh, drummer Atuso, guitarist, bassist, because he plays a guitar, bass, double neck. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. Um, cool already, Gabor. Sorry. It's cool. Oh, you knew already. already. Sorry. I just, I just, you know, I know it's common knowledge, but uh, <laughs> I just thought I wanted to mention it. Uh, Takeshi. He plays uh, bass, mostly bass, but also sort of low tune guitar, uh, and uh, guitarist. And actually, without really thinking about it, I chose two female guitarists because uh, Boris has a female guitarist called Wata. Cool. Um, and yeah, so Boris is a kind of a, a weird band, but I've really gotten into them lately. Um, so they're mostly known for playing quite sort of doomy music, quite heavy. Um, okay. I think they're generally tuned down quite low to C, maybe, I think. Um, and it's very heavy kind of music. They are, however, if you want to categorize them as anything, they're very unhappy about being categorized. They just they say, we're artists, we're musicians. We just, can't, whatever comes out, comes out. And I think with this album, they're actually, it's very different for what they do. If you listen to any of the other stuff or most of the other stuff, it's quite sort of doomy, low tuned, big chords, big sort of spacious things. But this is almost um, like very minimalist and almost um, uh-huh. sort of very atmospheric kind of music. I don't know. That's just a you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, usually all three of them share vocals, but for this album, it was uh, only uh, the only voice you hear on there is the guitarist Wata. Ah, um, yeah. She plays guitars, keys, and, wait for it, electric accordion. <laughs> electric accordion? Ele- through her amps and rig. Of course. Which That's is cool. Awesome. There's actually a really cool, um, if you go to the Earthquaker Devices um, YouTube channel, because uh, she only recently got a um, fuzz signature fuzz from Earthquaker Devices, um, which is called, uh, what is it called? The Hitsumas fuzz. Which is based on an old elk Big Muff clone, Japanese made Big Muff clone that she used to use all the time. Uh, but it kept breaking because it was really old and kept breaking. Um, so Earthquaker Devices cloned it kind of for her and did uh, her signature uh, Hizumitas fuzz. Uh, there's a really cool, uh, I think it's they're called Bored to Death, but Bored as in pedal board, Bored to Death. Uh... To death. Things that Earthquake Devices do, and she runs through a whole rig. She's got massive orange amps. Again, we just talked about orange amps. Massive orange and one matte amp. Yeah. And um, she lugs a big um, uh, Roland Space Echo around because she said nothing else kind of sounds like it. And um, with her, with them as well, it's sort of doomy, heavy stuff, but everything has got tons of delay on it and very sort of atmospheric stuff. Um, she plays mostly uh, Les Paul Custom, or pretty much only Les Paul Custom, uh, when she plays guitar. Uh, and the two tracks I chose, and again, I could have chosen any of them because they're all quite similar, but uh, Iceling and Drowning by Numbers are the two I picked uh, because they kind of, to me, they just have this, um, yeah, just very movie soundtrack-ish kind of vibe to them um, with a kind of spooky voice, whispered voice, which is... I think a whispered voice is probably the spookiest of all voices for me personally. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> And uh, and what I just what I wrote down with Iceland, one of the things I really like, if you listen to it, I think almost everything goes in one way or another through a space echo, because there's all these kind of these kind of gradual pitch changes that happen every once or quick okay. pitch change of just about every instrument you hear, and I always like that sort of stuff. The production generally is quite interesting. Um, and drowning by numbers, I pick because it's it's a super chaotic again, tons of delay. Mm. Um, and if you watch any of the live stuff of theirs on YouTube, you can. She constantly plays with the uh, space echo and constantly moves stuff around. And um, but now, okay, uh, let's start with Rob. <laughs> well, it's what funny. Were your thoughts? It's on funny Boris you mentioned w? the bass because I was listening to it last night with my wife um, in the living room. And she was yeah. like, "Oh, that sounds like bass," and I was like, oh, "I'm sure it's probably some, you know, detuned." Mm. Um, pedal, you like a pog or something by Earthquake device, Earthquaker devices, and and then you say it's a double neck bass. So uh, kudos to her for picking that out. Well, yeah. it's, it's it's a bass and a six string guitar. Um, yeah, and I think he uses he has a bass amp and a guitar amp behind him. I think it actually splits out of the guitar. One goes into the bass amp, one goes into the guitar amp, and he has a massive pedal board as well. They both have got quite a lot of pedals and and use a lot of looping because they also because they're only three P's. Okay, um, a lot of times they loop stuff. Yeah. And they have freeze pedals too, so they freeze things. And then because they do quite a lot on stage, if if you watch them, there's actually they they do a lot. Well, that's um, why I um that's why I was a bit confused when I first clicked on it because I thought oh I've clicked on the JHS live stream <laughs> <laughs> and they've got a whole bunch of Earthquaker devices and Death by Audio pedals, <laughs> yeah. and um it's they're just like demoing them. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like if people don't understand from the episodes that we've done so far i'm like i'm old school pop give (laughs) give me a hook give me a guitar riff um i'm like i'm in it for entertainment um music and i want (laughs) i want to sing and i want to dance and uh you know so i love all that stuff too yeah i I, I like making it more challenging but it made me want to it didn't make me want to get into the band it made me want to go and see if they have a rig rundown or what pedals yeah. making that sound because I could almost like more than enjoying the music I was listening to the sounds going ah oh, pretty much I think I know what pedal they're using there and you know it's it's all these you know Strymon stuff and Death by Audio and um a whole lot of delays and reverbs and also so it's great to hear that she, um the Space Echo gets a run um, yeah, 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 and, and uh, the accordion goes through it as well. Yeah, um, <laughs> and she's got a special switcher made because she has three amps. Yeah, and she can the switcher also switches between the different amps and and then routes the pedals to the different amps and stuff. So there's a lot going on. Yeah, so um, that made it less less about the music for me and more about the textures and tec- yeah. the experimentation with it. And I could just I could, took me to a place where I could see a couple of people sitting on a Turkish rug, you know, hitting something and turning knobs and getting all these weird sounds. So it's kind of like an art exhibition, you know, installation for Mm. me and Mm. crosses with music sort of thing. I mean, I think that's what this album is sort of meant to be, sort of textures and atmospheres and, and, yeah. Yeah. What what, what about you, Matt? Yeah, yeah, I was was digging it. Oh, cool. When when there's a band with one name, Boris – yeah, you know, I thought, okay, Madonna, Prince, Cher, <laughs> Boris. Yeah, Boris. maybe not. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. Brittany. Um, <laughs> actually, it reminded me of another one name, Bjork. It, it, Bjork. it struck me as a bit Bjorkish, which I guess the vocal Had a bit of that, from What's yeah. Up makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there's definitely a bit of Bjork in there, yeah. Yeah. Man, I really enjoyed it. It did take me back, um, yeah, to listening to music like this. Um Definitely, like at installations and yeah. improvised, improvised yeah. music gigs. Yeah. I used to go to a lot. Um, yeah. When I say improvised, not jazz impro. I mean improvised yeah. sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, noise, noise sound improv. Yeah, yeah, which I love. Which I yeah. love. I haven't gotten into for a while. I must admit. Um, but the old cliche that it, it rewarded close listening. Uh, that was a good. That was an, an apt cliche. Okay. Yeah, there was so much going on in the texture, especially drowning by numbers. That was, a, yeah, very a, chaotic and all over a bit the more place. More dense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I dug it. The oh, cool. 
the whispering was cool. I, I was waiting for a little bit more melody or something, but um, yeah, too, totally, totally interesting. I only listened to the two key tracks you gave, though. Is, is the rest of the album similar? Does it get doomier elsewhere? Uh, not really, not this album, no. Um, I, I then, just today, actually, I was listening to their previous album, No, and... Um, that's very thrashy, doomy kind of. It, a lot okay. of the stuff is very heavy, and then some albums lean more towards a kind of kind of really. Well, they did. Um, I don't know if you guys know guys know Sun O. So I was so just thinking about that. Yeah, the Doom Band. They did a, 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 a an album together with Sun O. Oh, okay. And they also did an album with Japanese noise artist Mersbo. I don't know if you ever heard of Mersbo before. Yeah, Mersbo, yeah. Mersbo, yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw him actually. Uh, so uh, uh, in Brisbane uh, a few okay. years ago, oh, not a long years ago, like I'm say, more, maybe more like twenty years ago. Uh, M- Mosbo and um, Mike Patton did a show together. Okay, yes, and it was yeah, crazy. Yeah. I bet, I bet. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so they, they collaborated with a lot of um, rather quirky artists, um, yeah. Boris, over the years. But yeah, some of the stuff is very doomy, sort of slow. Very slow beat, if any beats. Um, uh, you know, that I don't know, I guess you call it doom sludge, that sort of music. But okay. then it goes also into sort of almost punky direction, but then it also goes into sort of more thrash metal kind of direction. But then there's also almost a little bit of poppy influences in some of their albums because there's so many albums they've released. And the interesting thing with them... Did you say? Sorry? Did you say 27? 27 records? albums they've yeah, released, wow. yeah, studio albums. Uh, that's not including live albums that, re- that they've released. But um, and the thing, again, maybe it's a Japanese thing. Very often, looking at the cover and what the, the album is called and what the music is is very, very different. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you know, it can be very pretty flowers on the cover, and it's this full-on thrash metal thing. Um, but yeah, a very interesting band. Uh, if anyone wants to check them out, the sort of first album I got into and quite liked was an album called Pink, and I think that was their breakthrough kind of album as well. Um, from quite a while ago, uh, but cool. then since then, yeah, a lot of just very versatile sort of band, and um, to me, just yeah, it sort of sets moods and atmosphere. Uh, fears. I really like this album, for example, driving home after a gig at night. It's a sort of is a it, it it's kind of calming, and it's sort of I don't know. For me, I like that sort of stuff. Driving home after gigs. Yeah, nice. I think they should do a collaboration with Emily Hopkins. Like I reckon that'd go really good. You know the the girl, the YouTuber who does the pedal demos with the harp. Oh, see her, that? yes, yes, oh, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. great. Yeah, she's really good. It sort of yeah, would amazing. fit really well. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. that'd be cool. accordion, uh, electric accordion, and electric harp. Yeah, <laughs> do, it. do it. I think I think I've seen her posting too on pedal boards of doom or something, saying asking questions or something. Or oh, by the way, I play a harp through this rig. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's great. Her videos like, are oh, awesome. Oh, okay. I don't know what to suggest now. Yeah. Like, uh, pedal order question or, or something. <laughs> By the way, it's a half. It's awesome. Hey, well, the last record we've got for tonight is from a, another Japanese band. How about that? Yeah. And just backing up, um, Gabor, I haven't heard of Mer- I haven't heard Mertzbau mentioned for years. So that just. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Be, I, 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 love, I love a lot of that, that. stuff. I um if yeah. you, if you guys ever go through my record collection there's some very 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 strange stuff in there but that's that's it. that's my part in this iconic albums podcast. <laughs> I'm going to need Google role, I'm going to need Google's translate for some of that last conversation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's all the languages and then there's there's Gabor. Yeah, yeah there's me. Yeah, there's me. Gabor to English. Um <laughs> Yeah, so another Japanese band I chose, a band called Mono, post-rock band, been around since 1999. Their album, um, they've released two albums since 2020, but one of them was featured on the show. I spoke to Taka, the the lead guitarist and leader of the band, um, about their album Pilgrimage of Souls, which I loved so much. Um, But... It was it was outside of my rules for this show. So okay. they released a live album in 2021. Um, sorry, I've got to go back to my notes. They released a live album in 2021 called Beyond the Past, live in London with the Platinum Anniversary Orchestra. Hmm. So Mono, they're a four-piece. Taka, lead guitar, uh, Yoda. These are their Japanese nicknames. Uh, Yoda, 
mostly rhythm guitar and Tamaki plays bass and they've got uh, an American dude on drums now. Uh, Drew someone or other. So so t- he's the is he the guy you talk to, is he the jazz master guy? Yeah, I yes. knew you'd mention I that. I like him, yes. I already like him, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd bring that up. You'll love this Gabor. He's um he's got a sixty six jazz master. It's beaten up like nothing else. It's got masses of gaff on it, but it's pretty much stock except for anything that's been repaired from touring. Oh, cool, 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 cool. Now, when these guys first jammed in 99, Tucker loved the sound of the band so much. He's The rule is he's just got to play the same instrument. So he's only played the 66 Jazz Master on every gig and every album. Oh, wow, okay. Yoda has only played his 70 Strat, and Tamiki on bass, she's got an EB, one of those Gibson basses yeah. um, she's only played that on every record i mean different wow. pedals and amps but same guitars nah. okay um yeah which is kind of which is kind of cool but yeah uh, i guess they're lumped in the post-rock category of bands so um for me i, I was in the bands like godspeed you black emperor mogwai uh Sugar ross and and mono was sort of my my favorite post-rock they're all they're all quite different bands really but well, i guess actually- they get, Actually, I, I, Sigur Ross was a band I, I wrote down as it reminds one of the tracks. It reminded me a little bit of of Sigur Ross. So yeah, okay. interesting. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, so yeah, the two tracks. And <laughs> uh, slight apology, we were meant to give everyone two key tracks. I did that, but that, my two tracks were like twenty minutes worth. So. <laughs> 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 uh, Death to Rebirth, which which then morphed into Dream Odyssey. Thoughts, gentlemen? Any any post rock love out there? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, 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 a lot of the bands you mentioned before, I really dig. I, I, I hadn't heard of them before. I remember listening to your podcast with him, yeah, and thinking oh, I should check this out, but I, I never got around to it. So yeah, this was my first time listening to it. I really dug it. I really, really liked it. Um, uh, like I said, so the things I wrote down um, again. Uh, some way similarish to to the Boris album, you know, um, uh-huh. atmospheric, emotive soundtrack style music. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, a bit of dissonance at time as well, which is cool. Um, I wish because uh, it was a live video that I watched on on YouTube. Oh, okay. With yeah. some of the tracks on it, and there was an orchestra there, and I, something like a smaller orchestra in the back. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I sometimes wish they'd would do more i kind of went oh come on sure. give me some yeah. more orchestra but uh, that's that's what i wrote down but um uh yeah very atmospheric emotic emotive uh, soundtrack style music um and uh the outro of dream odyssey reminds me a little of Sigur Ross. okay yeah that's what i wrote down but yeah i dug it i really liked it yeah nice nice rob any any post rock in your life? No, I've got no North Star when it comes to this style. That's kind of just bypassed me. Um, oh, come on, Mogwai, man. Listen to some Mogwai. That's yeah, something. again, like I've heard of them, but I've never heard them, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm well and truly, you know, if this is left of centre, then I'm far right as far <laughs> as where this sits. Um, it was interesting. Yeah. Again, I found like I was just listening to the textures of yeah, it yeah. because there was no real hooks um, yeah. so much for me to grab a hold of, but definitely that soundtrack quality of um, of music that I could hear in the background of, you know, some Netflix series. Um, yeah. But, yeah, uh, it's mm. – I, I, don't, I really don't know how I feel about it. Like, again, it was just kind of like from a guitarist point of view, I was just trying to find – the guitars and what they were doing and what sort of sounds they were doing rather than me connecting it to an actual composition or the music yeah. of everything yeah. that was going on. Um, I was looking for a bit more melody, but I did like how it built, like cinematic that way. It did build. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it's from a guitar player's perspective, just able to contextualise how – something so big and verby and drippy and all of those other types of descriptions yeah. for reverb, how they fit in a band situation. Yeah, and, yeah. and again, I was sitting there listening to it. Probably it was the third time I'd listened to it and I was listening to it with my wife last night and it is just sitting there going, oh, like it's the only way that stuff can work is in that 
like the everything's got space to be heard and to breathe. Yeah. Whereas yeah. from from it's my it, yeah. yeah from my background of playing rock, I know yeah. that big delays and big fuzzes and all that kind of stuff and delays, uh, reverb, sorry, mm-hmm. don't work in a live band rock situation because yeah. there's no room for it. You need to leave yeah. the space. Yeah, like, and, yeah. and it'd be Absolutely. really, all I kept thinking was, oh, I'd love to just sit in in a band like that and mm. find like a different gear and a, um, for me as a guitar player and to compose that sort of stuff would be amazing. But, yeah, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, it's not something I would choose to listen to, but it was, um, again, from that perspective of finding um, the art in it, I enjoyed it from that perspective, yeah. Yeah, sure. That's. I mean, it's a really interesting thing you say too about thinking about it in a band context because, um, yeah, the music has to set up for it. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, those tones you can't, you can't pull out on a... On a covers gig that often. And you're playing a Stevie um, Ray song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, work. exactly. So, um, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I, I dig that stuff. One thing, one little tone recipe from the Tarka interview, he said we put the reverbs before the fuzz pedals. Yeah, yeah. And I started playing around with that. I mean, I always knew that was a thing. Um, but again, on a gig, I didn't want the mess. But when I when I was messing around with it at home, it's like, yes, this is post rock 101. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. light bulb exploding moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I was doing bands like this when I was at uni and I did a solo ambient gig for, for a while. And, oh, cool. Um, and even playing at church. Sometimes at church, the guitar's role is, is more of an atmospheric role yeah. versus out on a rock gig when you're riffing out. So sometimes I'll pull those tones out there. But yeah, it's not going to work for Jesse's Girl. <laughs> or brown eyed girl, no. Brown eyed girl. <laughs> Reverb it's, before the fuzz in brown eyed girl. It's it's yeah, the fuzz, yeah. Uh it's funny. Uh, <laughs> sh- shout out to I don't know if, if he's listening, but Stefan from the uh, the Pedal Zone, a fellow YouTuber. Uh I met him a few years ago in in, in Europe and um he's right into all that sort of stuff, post rock and shoegaze and that kind uh-huh. of that kind of style of music. And I said to him, So okay, so what do you do? Do you put the delay and reverb before the drive or after the drive? And he goes, no, no. What you do is you put delay and reverb before and, and after, after the yeah. drive. Both. <laughs> yes. Amen. That's how you yes. do it. <coughs> and yes. multiples of each. Um, yeah. yeah, it's the, yeah, it's it's the soft and hard taco. We can have yeah. both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's like a boost pedal, isn't it? Do you put it before or after the drives? Well, eventually you want one at each end. Yeah. It, it it just yeah. has a it has a very different sound to it when you run delays and reverbs into drives and it 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 it's just great. I, yeah. I, I really like doing that. Again, I wouldn't do it in a cover band scenario, but um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. For for writing stuff, it just creates a whole different vibe and world. Yeah, totally, totally. Cool. Well, we've just covered six excellent records. I'm going to say with some really cool guitar mm-hmm. that go from. A to Z, just to use that Z one more time. Z, Z top. <laughs> Z, Z top. Um, <laughs> man, how much, how much ground did we cover? Post-rock to that experimental to blues and rootsy stuff. Well, I think and, it's uh, just shown that guitar awesome. is relevant across a yeah, lot yeah. of genres, even in 2022. Yeah, you know? And there's room for everybody and every different type of gear and explains why – the pedal thing is just so huge because look at just from those artists, there's artists that don't use any pedals. There's artists that use one or two. And then there's (laughs) guys that are walking around with pedal boards that need their own private plane. Smart (laughs) people. That's right. Love it. Love it so much. Awesome. Guys, thanks so much. That's a great bunch of records. Thanks to everyone who um, sent some album suggestions as well. Again, just reinforcing what Rob just said, that the guitar is 100% relevant yep. and doing some cool some cool things. Hey, before we go, Rob and Gabor, can you tell the nice people listening where else they can find you and, and what you get up to? Gabor. I oh, mean, okay. Uh, well, if you want to hear me talk even more um, and see me uh, while I'm talking, uh, why not go to YouTube and check out my YouTube channel called The Super Fun Awesome Happy Time Pedal Show. Uh, all one word, no gaps. We don't do gaps. 
uh, where <laughs> I uh, re- we review pedals and amps and guitars and software and and I don't know slow cookers and everything. <laughs> Dog, so, uh, dogs, <laughs> yeah, pet dogs. Yeah, everything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and we do a podcast as well, which we very rarely do lately, but this year's been a bit re- shocking, actually. We've been really bad with it. But, yeah, so check us out there. The Super Fun Awesome Happy Time Pedal Show. Nice. Very cool. And Rob? Um, yeah, all, all my info can be found at roadtripent.com. We call Rob the hardest working man in showbiz because he's not only playing gigs all the time, he's creating gigs. Uh, with his with his seventies show and and so much cool stuff. Oh yeah, we're yeah. we're about to um, embark on something else for twenty twenty three. Which let's just say we're going to be bringing lonely people together. Ooh, ooh! Are you going to be wearing a cape while you're doing it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> dun, dun, Sounds dun, very dun, interesting. Dun, dun, yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll stay tuned. And Gabor, of course, we call we call him the Hugh Jackman. Of guitar because <laughs> the, the quadruple threat. <laughs> the quadruple That's right. threat. That's right. Videos, yeah. podcasts, yeah. gigs, teaching. Uh, do it all. Do it all. Does None it all. of it very good, but I do it all. <laughs> At least you do it all, mate. At least you're doing it all. <laughs> At least your diary's full. Yeah. Man, not sure you're killing it. Hugh Jackman. All right. <laughs> hey, we're out of here. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name's Matt Wakeling. You've been listening to me talk with Rob Rhodes and Gabor Jessica. And uh, we'd like to leave you with the words of wisdom from Michael Schenker, who once told me... Keep rocking. Keep on rocking. Keep on rocking, indeed. See you guys. Ciao. Bye.